lessons for today. Those three Bible sections are printed out at our website as, as the Bible readings uh, or bulletin for the week. And there will be three. And the John 3 that includes John 3, 16 is the first one. The reason that it's the leadoff hitter is because it refers to Jesus. Now here again, he's talking maybe like three years before his execution. And he's referring to his execution. He knows what's coming. He's talking to a Jewish Supreme Court Justice, Nicodemus. Nicodemus and another Supreme Court Justice, Ananias, one of his colleagues, were the ones who ended up taking Jesus' body and burying it. And so they'd be also really interested when they heard that Jesus came back to life. After they watched what happened to him on the cross, in, those, in the darkness, there was not much to watch. There was only stuff to listen to. And Jesus is saying that God is abandoning him. Jesus knows what's in the future for him. That's our first Bible reading. Uh, and then you'll see that we have Ephesians chapter 2. And then the last one is what Jesus refers to when he's talking to Nicodemus about the people of Israel in the desert and the the snake that Moses manufactured and adhered it to the pole, some pole that God told him to use. So without further ado, let's go to the Bible sections for this week. That first one is John chapter 3, and we're starting at verse 14. John 3, 16, you know, is the maybe the most famous sentence in the Bible. I mean, the one that people put on placards to use at professional sports events. They just want people to go and look at this one verse because it says it all. The part that we always remember about this verse is that it explains the two most important teachings of the Bible. First of all, what we call every person gets God's goodness. That's the first part of John 3.16, that God so loved the world or all the people in history that he gave his one and only son. So the, Jesus did his work and benefited everyone in history, but it isn't going to take effect for a person if they reject the news. And so the second part of John 3.16 says that whoever depends on the news of what he did in our place is the one that benefits. And the benefit is huge. It says you don't die. So we got what we call universal justification, just like universal health care means everybody gets health care everybody gets justification or everybody gets Jesus record of being totally holy, of being a saint. And then the second part of it is what we call personal justification, that God helps us depend on this news. And that's what brings us into his family of believers. Anyways, it's it's, a, it's an interesting Bible section because it's Jesus talking to a Jewish Supreme Court justice. And this guy is kind of skeptical. He's, he's scared of what he's hearing Jesus say. He thinks Jesus might be the Messiah. And he comes to Jesus under cover of darkness in the middle of the night to have a confidential conversation with Jesus. That's chapter three in John, but we're just getting this little snippet here. So let's take a look at it. People, Jesus says to Nicodemus, are going to put the son of man up on a pole the same way Moses put that metal snake up on a pole in the desert. Then Everyone who depends on him is going to live forever. God loved the people of this world so much 
that he gave his only son. So Jesus is talking to a Jewish Bible scholar who knows that the Bible talks in the Old Testament about a God, the son person. So he knows what that, the, that there's a God, the father and a God, the son. God loved the people of this world so much he gave his only son. Then everyone who depends on him is never going to die, but is going to live on forever. God sent his son here, not to sentence humanity to death, but to rescue them. God won't sentence anyone who depends on Jesus to death. People who won't depend on him already have God's death sentence because they won't depend on God's only son. This is why people get the death sentence. The light, the light, capital L, Jesus, came here to our world. Yet people do not want the light. They want the dark because they do evil things. People who do what's wrong hate the light and don't come to the light. It will show all the evil things they do, the light will. But people who live by the truth come to the light. They show the things they do happen because of God's power. God makes is the one who helped them depend on the news about Jesus, and then God's the one who helped them to do the Christian living thing that is really a challenge because of the hardwiring that comes with our psyche. So this, we really like this Bible section, and we get a taste of it during Lent because we're getting ready for um, Easter, to celebrate Easter. And Easter doesn't sound so great unless we see the truth about our own darkness and then get the benefit by, by, because of what Jesus did in our place. That takes us to the second Bible section for today. Now, this is in Ephesus. Oh, I just want to, I always want to just show you where these places are, because I want you to see, first of all, these are real places where real people lived. Not all of them were Jewish. There was a good percentage of them that were not Jewish people like you and me. And Ephesus is on the west coast of Turkey. That's Turkey, that country there where you see Ephesus is a coast city, a port city. And it's a big one. It's, you know, like an L.A. or a New York back in Bible times. And it's opposite the land of Greece, which is over there uh, in Rome is, and Italy is over to the right. Uh, technically, Ephesus is in what they called Asia. The Romans called it Asia, but it's the modern day country of Turkey. And when Paul wrote this letter, he said some amazing things about the human condition. And then he said some amazing things about how even though we don't have a leg to stand on, that God gave people the opposite of what they deserve. That's that grace word that shows up in here a lot. There's a lot of technical Bible words in this section. And the translation that's on the website is a, an attempt to try to make those simpler and more understanding. If you like, you know, uh, following along in a translation you're more familiar with, by all means, um, check it out. And you can either compare or just follow along in your translation. So here it is, Ephesians chapter 2. And you can see that in the middle of verse 5, it talks about, you know, how we were dead and God brought us back. 
made us responsive to this good news Jesus made possible. Here we go. God's mercy is immense. And what made him this way is his blind love, his love that goes out to everybody, just like that statue of justice is wearing a blindfold. So everybody's supposed to get justice. But in God's case, it's really true. God gives everybody the opposite of what they got coming. His blind love that sacrificed everything for us. We were dead inside. We step over the line he drew. Even then, he used Messiah to give us a new life when Jesus' body came back to life. See, it says, if we wouldn't have Easter, we couldn't be sure about where we stand with God. God made sure when he brought Jesus' body back to life that everybody would find out that it works. What Jesus did in our place really worked. It's God's kindness alone that rescued us. It gives sinners the opposite of what they deserve. That's that grace word. God brought us back to life, verse 6, together with Messiah Jesus, to rule with Jesus in heaven. Then, for all time, he can put on display how amazing his undeserved love for us has been by what Messiah Jesus has done in our place. It is God's love no one deserves that rescued you through depending on what Jesus did. You had nothing to do with it. It's all God's gift. And it doesn't depend on anything you've done, so no one can brag about it. God has made us what we are. Only God could fix it. And he has created us inside of Messiah Jesus to live lives full of doing good, this is what God planned for us long ago. So this Ephesians section is really meaningful because it kind of gives a summary of the benefits that what Jesus did for everybody has earned everybody. And then the last of our Bible readings is this one from the Old Testament part of the Bible. We always want to get an Old Testament section in here because it's the Bible that Jesus uh, had. It's the Bible that Jesus knew, and it's the Bible that he taught to people. And that, so in, his, in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, it's what he's referring to when he gives explanations, like the John 3, 16, uh, John 14, that we started out with today about the snake on a pole. Here's that account. It is, for our benefit, it's going to help, I think, to uh, see the uh, chronology, the time frame. You can see in this section if you look on the bottom of the timeline, it mentions Miriam's death. Miriam is Moses' sister. Uh, Jewish people called almost, called a lot of their daughters Miriam after this famous sister of Moses. All Marys that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, including Jesus' mother, their Jewish name is Miriam. So she's really famous. And she died about uh, 40 years after the people of Israel were um, traveling from Egypt to the promised land. And then you see right next is when Aaron dies. And Aaron's death is what it's referring to at the beginning in verse 1 here of our Bible section. They, they spent maybe 30 days, a month there, at the spot on near the mountain where head priest Aaron died and his son took his place and you can see at the end of the line here's where this bronze or metal snake thing took place and it all happened because of the people's grumbling you see that up right above the bronze snake thing 
take a look at this Bible section. Then the people of Israel left Mount Hor, where head priest Aaron's body died. The people took the road that leads to the Gulf of Aqaba. They had to take a detour to get around the country of Edom. The people got impatient with the long trip. They criticized God and Moses. They said, why did you make us leave Egypt? Now, this is ancient history. It's 40 years earlier, almost a half a century earlier, just to let us die in the desert. There's no bread or water, and we can't stand this miserable manna. So Yahweh sent poisonous snakes that bit and killed a lot of the people. The people of Israel went to Moses and admitted it was wrong of us. We insulted Yahweh and you. Please ask him to make these snakes go away. So Moses prayed for the people. And Yahweh told Moses, make a snake out of bronze, put it on a pole. Anyone a snake bites can look at it and they won't die of snake bite. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. People looked at the bronze snake after a snake had bitten them and they did not die from that snake bite. Uh, somebody in the last hour's Bible study mentioned there might have been a bunch of people who had to look at that snake on a pole more than once. They had to look at it over and over again because they kept getting bit by snakes. Why would God let them just keep getting bitten, the venom keep getting injected, and then they're on death's door when they look at this snake, this fake snake on a pole, and then they're safe. This is our best guess of what these snakes look like. Some people who are more snake experts than I certainly am, they say that down in this part of the desert, there's one called the carpet viper. And the thing that stands out about this is it's kind of its color. It's kind of got a color of copper or bronze in it. And that may be the reason that God told Moses to make a snake out of metal of that color. Because it's a replica of the snakes that were the problem. the place where they buried Moses' brother, Aaron, is in this area. At least this is where people say it happened. You never know when it comes to these kind of memorials, if you're getting the actual place or not, but you can see it's at a higher elevation and you can see that the you know, Moses was a big deal to get this kind of monument. And you can see where it is on the map here. Mount Sinai is down on the bottom, way down here. And, and the ocean in this area makes two fingers. One that goes up towards Egypt, where they got the uh, Suez Canal today. And then one over here that's this Gulf of Aqaba and the city of Ezion Geber, which is called Elat in Bible times. And then in this square is the spot where Moses' brother died. And you can see up here then, or if you go over to this map, you can see here's Mount Hor. And then the people of Israel have to go the opposite direction of the one they had been going, not straight north into the Holy Land,
but they have to go straight south all the way down to this port city to bypass the country of their relatives, the Esau people, or Edom. God didn't want them to have a military confrontation down there. And so he told them to go south as far as they could till they hit the ocean. Then they could go north on a highway that is uh, still available today. It's called the King's Highway. And it, it goes north um, from this city, this port city, Easy and Geber. It goes all the way up to the spot where it says Mount Nebo. That's where Moses would end up dying that same year. Moses and Aaron die the same year. It's at the end, as, as you see on the slide, it's at the end of the 40 years of the people in the desert. Boy, that's a lot of water under the bridge, which you probably shouldn't say about this 40 years in the desert. Not a lot of water and no bridges. But remember what's going on here. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he's living the life. He is the biggest celebrity in the country of Egypt because he's in the royal family. And then that's his first 40 years. Then he messes up completely by committing murder. Last thing on the top here. And then the next 40 years he spends as uh, an itinerant shepherd working for a guy whose daughter he marries. 40 years of that. So he's 80 years old when he sees the burning bush and God tells him to be God's representative to, to rescue the people of Israel. And then that, so he's 80 when that happens. And then his last 40 years is taken up with being God's conduit, God's, uh, God's mouthpiece for the people of Israel as they make their way through this country. You can see here, at the end, the very last thing on the timeline is Moses' death in that spot uh, that we saw on the map a little earlier. So Moses, his sister, and his brother all die before they can go into the land that God was taking them to. They all had to die before because they had all messed up during the 40 years. And the penalty for that was that God said they could not be among the finalists that would survive and get to cross over into the promised land. Uh, Moses um, had, God had Moses pick Joshua to be the leader of the people to that point. So they're pretty close. They're, you know, within a few months of getting into the promised land. And here's another map that kind of shows you, you know, how this worked. What an awkward route this was from when Moses' brother died here on this Mount Hor. And then this trip all the way south to really no man's land. And then taking the major road that everybody else took that was traveling up to Syria and Damascus. You know, this, this is what put the people of Israel over. If you look again at this Bible section, it says they left Mount Hor and they took the road that leads down to this Gulf of Aqaba. And then they took a detour to get around the country of Edom. They're just bypassing it entirely. And that's where they got impatient. This detour just put them over the top. And then they started complaining about the dietary restrictions. All they got is manna, this mystery food that God made materialize on the desert floor every morning. And God had to provide them with water. This, this um, repetitive diet is what drove the people crazy right near the end. The... Uh, the, there's only so many different ways you can make manna. And um, as all of us do, if we know we're going to get leftovers every day, you know, it can get a little tiresome. 
And this complaining thing is something that's so natural to you and me. You and me can complain about any and everything. We have way more blessings than the people of Israel did here, living as migrants in the desert. And then, and yet complaining is second nature to us. That's why it's kind of shocking to us that God sends these poisonous snakes to give the death sentence to so many Jewish people. And it's just because of their griping and complaining. Our griping and complaining is just another way that we say we know more than God and that he is dumb and I am smart. Why doesn't God listen to me? The people prayed for the snakes to disappear and God said, no, he wasn't going to make the snakes go away. That wasn't going to be the way he saved them. Instead, he gave these instructions that we have in the last paragraph of our Bible reading. Make a snake out of bronze, God told Moses, and put it up on a pole. And anyone a snake bites can look at that metal snake, that fake snake, and they won't die of snake bite. And so Moses made the bronze snake and put it on a pole. And people looked at the bronze snake after a snake had bitten them and they did not die, even though they had lethal venom in their system. Fact of the matter is that all of us are full of poison we don't recognize this and press the panic button like these people did because there's no snake biting us. But every one of us is a, a future fatality. We don't know how long God's going to give us, but we do know because of sin that every single human being is not going to make it. Every single human body of every person we know is going to die unless Jesus arrives here uh, first. This is such a normal thing to us that when, when people die, we hear those who folks look to for comfort and stability saying stuff like, well, death is a natural thing. And it isn't a natural thing. God never meant for human beings' bodies to die. And so the reason God didn't take the snakes away from the people of Israel, and he doesn't take the poison out of us and reverse our death sentence is because we need that because we're so dull. It's so normal to us to think that we are fine, that there's nothing wrong, and that everything's okay. And, and we need the alarm clock that the Bible sets off that tells us something is really, really wrong. And the problem is not God being a jerk. The problem is me. When they have little kids in Sunday school uh, do, you know, some crafts about this particular Bible account, about the fake snake on a pole. It's interesting to look at the different designs for how the kids make the metal snake. Some of them have it more straight going up and down on the pole. Some of it have it twisting around. We saw pictures like this earlier of the metal snake up at the top. And then it looks kind of like a T. It kind of looks like the word the Bible uses for a cross, which the, the word in the original language is the word for a T, to hang somebody on a pole that's shaped like the letter T. And this is what Jesus talked about in the first paragraph of the John 3 section we looked at today. It says people are going to put the Son of Man on a pole. Jesus told this to Nicodemus, the, the Jewish Supreme Court Justice, who was very familiar with these Old Testament accounts. And, and then he said in verse 15 that everyone who depends on Jesus 
is going to live, but they're not just going to survive a snake bite. They're going to live on forever and nothing is going to kill them. It seems as though these snakes had a kind of copper looking color. And so that's the reason that God had Moses make the snake that was fake and look that color too, not just a little bit. Those snakes may have had, you know, other color variations to make them blend in with the, the rocky ground around them. But this snake was full of that color. In the same way that Jesus is full of the, the responsibility for every sin of every single human in history, Jesus looks just like the people who are full of the image of Satan, which is every single person, right? He doesn't have that poison inside of him. We were born with it. Jesus was not born with it. He was like Adam, and he kept himself in pristine condition, not to lord it over people, but to say, look what I'm going to donate for you. Sometimes people ask questions like this. This is on this uh, website. God questions about where did Jesus go when he died? And where did Jesus go? And there was a time I remember when I first started out being a pastor that somebody asked this in a Bible class. And I really did not know the answer. I asked the class. I put it out there to all the group members. I said, do you know I mean, does the Bible say anything about where Jesus went when he died? And one of, an old elder man in the group raised his hand. He said, you know, uh, he's dressed up like a cowboy. He said, it's obvious. Jesus told us. He says, Father, into your hands, I entrust my soul. And so that's where Jesus went. He went right away to heaven when he died. So then where's the problem. I mean, Jesus, in other words, stayed alive even after his body died. He was still alive in heaven. It was everything before that while he was on the cross, where he, the Bible explains, was taking the heat of God's wrath for every single human's every single sin. There's consequences when you absorb the full weight of responsibility for every one of every human's wrongdoing and attitude issues. And this is why that John 3, 16 passage is so important. God loved the people of the world so much. He gave them his own son. God, the son is who that person on the cross is. Whoever depends on him is never going to die. We, we grew up hearing God so, loved the, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Perish means die. And that's what the Bible's saying. You're never going to die. It's not just snake bites you're going to escape. You're going to escape death. Now, your body will die, but you won't feel it because the part of you that feels stuff will right away be alive still in heaven. This is... Jesus in John 3, 16, right? There is no other antidote for death. And there is no other remedy for fixing what's wrong with us and making sure we're right with God. And this is something that the Bible says in John 3, 16, God did this for everybody. God so loved the world. So no matter who you are, this is God's communication from heaven to inform you. It's not hopeless. Life isn't hopeless because if you have the saint status that only Jesus can give and gave it to everybody, then you know that everything that happens in our lives is a blessing, even though it doesn't feel like a blessing. These snakes coming out of nowhere and biting people fatally certainly didn't seem like a blessing to them, but it really was. There was no other way for them to point out that only God has the antidote. And we know 
that the news about Jesus is the only way for us to stay safe. In, in heaven, there won't be any anybody crowing about stuff they've done, either for God or accomplished for themselves. There won't be anybody doing that. Everybody in heaven is going to be crowing about what Jesus did in our place. Here, it's really difficult to value that properly because it's natural for us to disregard it, evaluate it poorly, and, and not give it a lot of worth in our minds. But one day we're going to see the truth. And we're going to be so excited God did not give up on us or retract what he earned for us. The people of Israel, when they saw Moses' brother dying and Moses' sister dying and later on Moses dying, that had to be an incredible blow. They had to think, well, there's some people who get it right. And the fact is nobody gets it right. And everybody, including Moses, needs that antidote. Remember, it was Moses who appeared on that mountain that one time with Jesus, along with Elijah. They were, Moses was alive yet, even though his body had died. And he was talking with Jesus. Him and Elijah were talking with Jesus about what he was going to do to rescue us, just the same way as what we do this time of year when we get together on Wednesdays and during Holy Week when we talk about you know, the, the final day of Jesus and why it's relevant to us today. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we're grateful for this relevant gift of your son in our place. We don't feel like we're in that much trouble. This snake bite that is that's injected into us is one of those things that makes us feel like there's nothing wrong but there's something really wrong with us and if it wouldn't be for you we wouldn't know about it so we're grateful for the news about what's wrong with us and we're grateful as well for the seemingly ridiculous remedy that only comes through jesus that only comes through your son in our place so Thank you for that gift. And thanks for not taking it away from us when we prove once again that, that we are boneheads and that we don't get it right. Thank you for giving the gift that keeps on giving. We can look to Jesus all the time and be sure our sins are taken away. Your Bible promise guarantees that. So what are we doing here? Well, we know the reason that we can continue to have something to live for is that there are people who live in the dark about this yet and don't understand the news about Jesus. So help them do, help us play a role in Jesus' name. Amen. So now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself to you that comes courtesy of Jesus' life in our place his damnation death as well. The Lord all the time is blessing you and protecting you. Constantly, God is making his face smile on you. He's blessing you. And he's giving you the opposite of what you deserve. The Lord is looking on you with his favor. He's paying attention to every detail of our lives. And he's still giving us his peace. So that is our time together this week. We, we are doing that half hour on Wednesdays to look to dedicate some time to looking at the details that the Bible's first four New Testament books give about Jesus last day. And that um, I'm really enjoying this year. Number one, because I don't have to go to other churches and have substitute pastors come in here. I'm able to do this all ourselves because we're doing it online. So it really is enjoyable. We're continuing to get together at 5.30 on Wednesdays. There's a special uh, spot there on the website you saw today for the Wednesday get-togethers. It's a Zoom thing as well. 